Hey, what's going on, you guys? This is your boy, Bill Mahari here, representing Mahari Nation Sports Podcast. who has much love to the entire LDBC and the basketball community. Um, I wanted to talk about something that's really, really important here. Um, a couple of days ago, the Athletic released a one-on-one interview with uh, Kevin Garnett, who's going to be inducted into the Basketball uh, Hall of Fame, along with Tim Duncan and Kobe Bryant, RIP to uh, Kobe Bryant. Um, he did a one-on-one uh, interview with Shams uh, Carnadia of The Athletic and touched upon various subjects here. But the one that really got the most attention was uh, when Garnett decided to retire his number five jersey during the 2021 season and has de- declined to retire his number 21 jersey in Minnesota, which is going to be which is the main subject of this video here. Now, when that question was brought up in this article, here's what is what uh, Garnett had to say. This is going to be just some swear words too, so bear with me on this. Here's what he said, end quote. Glenn knows where I'm at. I'm not entertaining it. First of all, it's not genuine. Two, he's getting pressure from a lot of fans, and I guess the community there. Glenn and I had, a, it, had an understanding before Flip died, and when Flip died, the understanding, that understanding went with Flip. For that, I won't forgive Glenn. I won't forgive him for that. I thought that he was a straight-up person, straight-up businessman. And when Flip died, everything went with him. There's no reason to complain, just to move on. My years in Minnesota in that community, I cherish. At this point, I don't want I don't want any dealings with Glenn Taylor or or Taylor Corporation or anything that has to do with him. I love my Timberwolves. I always will love my guys. I will I'll always love the people who fuck with me up there. I always have a special place for that city of Minneapolis and the state of Minnesota in my heart. But I don't do business with snakes. And I don't do business with snake motherfuckers. I try not to do business openly with snakes or people who are snake-like. End quote. Now, the reason why this is making a lot of headlines is because here's what's, here's what's happened here. This is how kind of the beef between Glenn Taylor and, you know, KG started. So when KG returned to Minnesota in 2015 through a trade through Brooklyn, okay, it was kind of agreed upon, but his kind of desire was to basically form an ownership group with Flip Saunders in succeeding Glenn Taylor and at least at the hope be a business decision maker or maybe a general manager within the franchise. Um, Unfortunately, uh, Flip Saunders died of a very terrible, rare skin disease. And when Flip Saunders died, okay, um, Taylor charted his own different direction, and he hired Tom Thibodeau to take over as head coach and as executive of basketball operations. And unfortunately, KG felt that he was stabbed in the back, and as a result, he parted ways with Glenn Taylor. You know what I mean? But unfortunately, what what was also missing in all of this is is that league rules at the time prevented Taylor from having ownership discussions with any player on the roster. And during that time, Garnett was still a player. He hadn't retired yet. Now, I agree with Kevin Garnett wholeheartedly on this because, you know, he was a man that gave so many years, you know, to the city of Minneapolis. And living there, he really knew how to rock the target center. Now, I'm broken to this video part in several sections here, okay? Because I've already talked about where the beef kind of centered from, but now I'm going to get to rewind back how KG was receiving no help, okay? Now, as you guys already know, or for most of you that don't know, Kevin Garnett came into the NBA as a high schooler. He was the fifth overall pick in the 1995 uh, NBA draft that features some very good, talented players there. You know, you understand what I'm saying? But coming out of high school, you know, since he became the first high school player to come out of, to the draft since 1975. But he was coming into a, to a team that had not had any previous success since becoming an expansion franchise during the 89-90 season, okay? And it took him at least two years for the Timberwolves to make the playoffs. And before the 96-97 season, um, they drafted Stephon Marbury, and they were supposed to be the next one-two combination to really build themselves into a lead team in the uh, Western Conference. You know, you know what I mean? But this is where things really went south, down south, and this happens 
during the off season in 97. Now, Garnett and his agent at the time, you know what I mean? They were negotiating his con. They were basically negotiating a new contract. And what turned out to be was on October 1st of 1997, the Timberwolves agreed upon with Garnett and his agent on a six year deal worth $126 million, which is one of the biggest contracts in NBA history uh, during that time. All right. And unfortunately, because of that big contract, many, including the fans, which includes myself, felt that the contract was way too risky because it wasn't it wasn't going to be able to help the the Timberwolves get the necessary pieces to help Garnett win some championships, especially in that tough Western Conference. All right. And we're going to get into the Western Conference in a few minutes. But his numbers, you know, began to improve. But the relationship between him and Marbury deteriorated because Marbury wanted to have the same kind of money or maybe at least be the main franchise player. But when that wasn't going to be the case, you know what I mean? You know, Garnett and Marbury went their separate ways. You know, Marbury got traded to the New Jersey Nets and they got another former all-star Terrell Brandon out of this. And they made the playoffs the first three seasons. They lost in 97 against the Houston Rockets, who had three future Hall of Famers. All right. Both Akeem Olajuwon, Charles Barkley, and Clyde Drexler. I'm sorry. There's no way they were going to make any noise in that series. Okay. Now, in 98, it was a bit different. They went up against the Seattle Supersonics with just Gary Payton and Vin Baker. Because remember, uh, Sean Kemp was re- was traded during the offseason because he didn't get a contract raise in his uh, extension deal. And they gave another bum uh, center named Jim McElvain seven years for $33.5 million over their franchise player. I'm sorry. One of the worst alt deals in NBA history. But... To get back to that point, the Timberwolves were up two games of one until they lost the last two games to lose to the series in five. So that's two straight years they lost in the first round. All right. And then in the shortened 99 season, they only won 25 games. And then they got they lost in four games to the eventual NBA champion, San Antonio Spurs, that had Tim Duncan and David Robinson. And now we're getting into the Western Conference during the early 2000s because not just with Tim Duncan and the and the Spurs that were a phenomenal team. You had Shaq and Kobe and the Lakers that were winning three straight championships. You had the Portland Trail Blazers who the Timberwolves faced again the next year, even after they won 50 games, because the Blazers went on the went on to win at least 59 games and also made it and also made it to the conference finals against the Lakers. And that team in 2000 was deep. You had Pippen, you had Wallace, you had Stoudemire. You had Steve Smith. You had Sabonis, who can still play despite the bad knees. Brian Grant off the bench. You had Stedler Shunt coming off the bench. Uh, Bonzi, Wills, Greg Anthony off the bench. I mean, I'm sorry. That was just a deep team that the Timberwolves could not contend with. You understand what I'm saying? Then the next year in 2001, they made the playoffs as an A seed. And then they went, and then again, they got waxed by the Spurs. All right. Now, why is that big contract? you know, so relevant in their playoff defeats because they could not build any good teams around KG. And the other thing that also made the huge difference was the infamous Joe Smith contract. Now, during the 99-2000 season, it was reported that both Glenn Taylor and general manager Kevin McHale um, allegedly promised Joe Smith a multi-million dollar deal if they would assign Smith to a below market deal which allowed the team to make some additional moves in the short-term run. So as part of that, you know, agreement, Smith would sign three one-year contracts for less than $3 million apiece, which allowed them to retain his Burt rights during the, on the Larry Burt exemption rules during the rules of the CBA. Um, at the end of that one-year uh, contract, the third and last one, it was, it was going to be negotiated that he was going to be been paid at least as much as 86 million. And when the NBA found out what the Tim Wolves were doing, they basically said, Nope, that's not happening. And the team was fined at least three and a half million dollars. They avoided all three of those contracts. Okay. Then after that, they barred the toner Glenn Taylor at least one year of all any role of Tim Rolls operations. But here's the big, big knock of this whole situation. 
David Stern had the audacity to strip the Timberwolves at least five of the future first uh, five first round picks through 2001 up until 2005. Okay, until the 03 uh, uh, pick was ultimately you know returned back to them. But think about it: you had at least four straight, at least four to five straight years where you have no first round picks. Can you imagine what the Timberwolves could have done? With those draft picks, if they would have would have had a better job of uh, basically financing their salary cap better and not giving KD that contract and not trying to sign the bum as Joe Smith, you understand what I'm saying? It really was the one of the big reasons why the Timberwolves couldn't go no couldn't go anywhere until the 0304 season, okay? Because the Timberwolves lost to the Spurs again. Then you had the Dallas Mavericks who were up and coming with Nowitzki and Nash and Finley. And the Timberwolves faced them in the playoffs and got swept 3-0, in which Dirk Nowitzki averaged about 33 points per game and grabbed 16 rebounds and basically outplayed Garnett throughout the whole series. All right? Then you go back to the 3 season, okay? This is before the MVP year. I'm talking about 2 3 the, the Timberwolves made the playoffs, you know what I mean, as a, basically as a uh, as a fourth seed. And then they basically went up against the three-time defending champion Lakers and still couldn't get out of the first round. I mean, you when you look at the roster makeups of the Timberwolves during that time, Wally Zerbeck was a decent player. You know, Darrell Brandon was kind of a decent player, but he was going through knee injuries, okay? You had Rasha on the stairs that wasn't much, okay? You had Anthony Beal who had his moments, but not really consistently. And then they still signed the, the bum Joe Smith again, all right, and still didn't get get anything out of it. I mean, you think about it. The, if you're a Garnett, you had to be frustrated because the Timberwolves kept cutting you at every single turn, and they did you no favors while in your prime, while basically carrying the team basically by yourself with little to no help at all. It wasn't until the 3 4 season when the Timberwolves finally got off their ass and finally signed some help. They signed Sam Cassell, and they signed Latrell Sprewell. Two big signings, all right? It was probably the only time in his career that KG had true legitimate help. And, you know, KG had the best season of his career. You understand what I'm saying? He averaged basically, he basically averaged about 24 or 24 points. And he won the MVP and led the Timberwolves to the Western Conference Finals up until they lost to that loaded L.A. team, which was Gary Payton, Kobe Bryant, Carl Malone, and Shaquille O'Neal, all right? And he did talk about in the article, too, KG was is that he was kind of frustrated because he – because remember, during that series, KG had to play the point guard position because Sam Cassell was just too injured. He was just too, you know, he was just too hurt to continue to keep on playing. And unfortunately – the loss of San Cassell really proved to be the straw that broke the camel's back to having any chances of winning a championship. And then they ended up losing the six games by next year. You know what I mean? Um, Cassell was getting injured more often. And then Spreewell was just playing inconsistent basketball and he declined a three year, $21 million extension. Okay. Because it felt because in his mind, it said it was enough to feed his kids and ultimately Spreewell's career pretty much ended after that, all right? And, you know, the Timberwolves, they basically, you know, signed bum player after bum player the next uh, four seasons after his uh, MVP year. And, you know, KG, a loyal man to a fault, tried to, tried to stick with it and try to and try to hang on to the hope that the Timberwolves could make it work, and it just could not work. By that time, you know, Glenn Taylor and, you know, Kevin McHale recognized that, listen, we're not going anywhere with Garnett. We need to at least trade him so that way he has a chance to win a championship and we get something out of it. And and nearly the Lakers almost pulled off a deal sending uh, KG to the Los Angeles Lakers and play with Kobe Bryant, but it didn't happen. So by that time, they traded him to the Celtics and paired him up with Ray Allen, who they got during uh, draft night. And to tag along with Paul Pierce, and they won their championship. All right, they won their championship. They made the finals uh, two out of three years. They should at least won their second championship. But KD didn't injure his knee in the '09 season, you know, towards the end of the '09 season, into the playoffs. You know what I mean? 
um, you know, he built a really good legacy for himself. But let's keep this in mind a couple of things, okay? Um, the Western Conference in the early 2000s was deep. I mean, KG went up against, you know, the Spurs, the Lakers with the with Shaq and Kobe and the duo, all right? You had the Sacramento Kings with Chris Webber, all right, that made the Western Conference Finals in 02 and was only a game away from the finals. You also had the Dallas Mavericks who were up and coming with Dirk Nowitzki and Steve Nash at the time holding down the fourth. All right. I mean, think about it. The West was was pretty much deep those years. Then you had the Warriors that were up and coming. Then the Rockets were up and coming. Though too. I mean, think about it. The Western Conference during the early 2000s was basically deep. And the Timberwolves did absolutely no favors in helping KG get to that promise of a championship in Minnesota. So if you're Garnett, you got to be thinking to yourself that, you know, I'm just frustrated a sec because I stuck it out with the Timberwolves for so many years. And they done me no favors. And my opportunity to try to at least get back to the, to the organization that made me a Hall of Famer, this is what you do to me? I can understand that mindset. Now, on the other side of the ledger, I could probably see, understand Glenn Tennant's point of view where, listen, I don't think I don't think we had an agreement to at least, I don't think there was no other agreement or I didn't even hear about, you know, you and Flip wanted to build the ownership group to try to buy out the team. Now, we don't know what was said behind the scenes and what's to say if it's true or not what Glenn Taylor talks about. But it's got to suck for KG to a certain extent because, you know, you dedicated so many years in Minnesota and the franchise kept cutting you at every single corner. And you had to look at yourself like, why am I wasting my time here? And I wish KG was not a as a loyal person as he was because if he would have saw the writing on the wall earlier on in his career, he should have had he should have recognized that. Listen, I'm going to just request a trade and get out of this situation because it's obvious it's, we're not going anywhere with this Timberwolves team. And I think that think that that right there is one of the biggest frustrating points for KG in his terms of his basketball career. But you know, being living here in Minneapolis and watching him rock the Target Center was one of the greatest experiences that you'll ever see. I mean, KG played with his heart and his soul for that Timberwolves jersey every single night. And you have to feel for him because, you know, the, the franchise did him absolutely. Once again, they did nothing to help him reach that goal of a championship. And you just got to feel for him for that. But hopefully that somewhere down the line that at least, a, at least some, at least both sides can at least agree upon to, you know, retire his, his jersey because retiring in Boston is a good, it's kind of a good thing. But he needs to retire his jersey with a team that he basically built his career from in the first place. I mean, it just doesn't feel right that his number one twenty one jersey is not hanged up in the Raptors because in his prime, he was the only franchise on that team. And it just seems unfair that, you know, his jersey number is not being retired. And, yeah, a lot of fans are putting pressure on the or on the Glenn Taylor organization to do that. But as long as KG has still breath in that body, I just don't think it's going to happen for a long time unless something does change. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section.